The growing season is underway and for those of you with greener fingers than I have, the greenhouse will no doubt already have been gutted, waiting to receive this year's plants and seeds. Fresh compost will have been bought and soil feeds will be at the ready. Hopefully there will be lots planted to attract butterflies and bumblebees of all sorts, plants that will be enjoyed by more than just us and that grow as a reminder of how interrelated and interdependent the whole of life is. Those who garden and those who croft and farm are, I suspect, much more aware of that than the more urbanites amongst us. Today, let's all spare a thought for the oneness of creation and try to live caring for it in a way that ensures everyone's lives are enriched, including the life of the planet itself. In the beauty of the natural world, in bugs and plants, in animals and birds, fish and forests, night skies and scurrying clouds, may we see the imagination and signature of a wonderful creator. As we look to the great variety of humanity, facial features and hair colours, skin colours, languages spoken, cultural backgrounds, as well as the expanse of gifts and talents that human beings express, May we celebrate the diversity of this world and play our part in ensuring it enriches the lives of all. And may we be ready too to thank the one who brought and brings everything into being. When we fail, Lord God, to treat the whole of your creation with the respect it deserves, then forgive us, we pray, and remind us in the power of the sun and wind and rain in the rhythm of day and night, in familiar and unfamiliar faces, remind us whose world this is and whose we all are. These things we ask in Jesus' name, who taught his friends to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Last week we heard of Jesus as the Good Shepherd. This week Jesus likens himself to a vine. Listen now to words from John's Gospel, from chapter 15. I am the real vine, and my father is the gardener. He breaks off every branch in me that does not bear fruit, and he prunes every branch that does bear fruit, so that it will be clean and bear more fruit. You have been made clean already by the teaching I have given you. Remain united to me, and I will remain united to you. A branch cannot bear fruit by itself. It can only do so if it remains in the vine. In the same way, you cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will bear much fruit, for you can do nothing without me. Those who do not remain in me are thrown out like a branch and dry up. Such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire where they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, 
Then you will ask for anything you wish, and you shall have it. My Father's glory is shown by your bearing much fruit, and in this way you become my disciples. Growing things takes time. You can't just stick a seed in the ground one day and expect to waken up to a garden full of flowers the next or to a greenhouse full of tomatoes. Growth is slow and slower for some things than it is for others. I had to look it up, of course, but the quickest growing vegetables are radishes and spring onions, apparently, which you can harvest after just 21 days. And while you can grow some mushrooms in just 20 days, maybe even 10 from a kit, it takes 10 years to know if your truffles are fruit bearing or not. But then a typical English oak tree takes 40 years, even just to begin producing acorns. It doesn't reach its peak of fruitfulness until it's about 80 to 120 years old. Some things it seems just can't be hurried. And yet we live in a world, especially here in the West, we live in a world where we want things instantly. Even those things that were never meant to be instant. Have a look at the adverts you see, for example, for anything from diets to learning a language to playing an instrument. Even growing hair, everything is geared to seeing results as quickly as possible. And people fall for the sell. We buy the tablets that will speed up the shedding of the pounds. We buy the language and music systems that will make us fluent or concert pianists in just a few months. And we buy the potion that will take away the baldness in a matter of weeks. And we do that knowing in our heart of hearts that none of these products are the least but likely to be able to do what they seem to be saying on the label. So why do we fall for it? Why do we do it? Well, if I was being kind, I would say that we do it because we're hopelessly hopeful. But it may well be that in fact, the reason that we fall for these quick fixes is because we don't actually have the patience, the stickability, the perseverance, or the commitment that is needed to start on something and then follow it all the way through. We are suckers for the easy option precisely because it seems easy. And if it doesn't work right away, then we give up and we blame it on the product and certainly not on us. Imagine though, if seeds and plants did that. Imagine if the acorn gave up growing because it wasn't an oak tree after a few months. Imagine an azalea giving up because it wasn't a beautiful flower in a week. I am the vine, says Jesus. You are the branches. This is a slow burner we're talking about, a long-term relationship, but it's a relationship in which all we need in order to be all we can be, flows to us through the generosity of the trunk of the vine. It might take some of us longer than others to produce fruit, but that's because we need to get the message that life is not what we make it. As branches, we are not the ones who choose when and how we bear fruit. As branches, it's all about remaining in Christ, depending on him. It's all about letting him feed through to us 
the nutrients, everything that we need in order to blossom. And then waiting with him to see what blooms. But that's not what happens these days, is it? These days, if things don't happen in the time scale that people think they should, or things don't work out as people think they ought, then they just move on. They move on to the next church, to the next guru, to the next faith, or to the next trendy spiritual idea. It's always the faith that fails, not us, not people. How come? Well, it's because we've begun to treat faith as we treat everything else in our consumer oriented lives. We treat the faith as something personally reviewable. And if the faith we visit doesn't come up with the goods as far as we're concerned, if it doesn't meet our expectations, then the number of likes or stars that we give it will go down and we end up tweeting our disappointment with that faith. We post our disgruntlement at how slow it is to bring about change and, and we quickly unfriend anyone who might question our commitment to serious engagement with that faith and with what it might actually entail. The hope we have that faith will somehow deeply enrich our lives without ever changing us too much. The idea that, that faith will transform us and the world without ever asking anything of us or ex expecting anything of us means that remaining in Christ for us is something that is incredibly hard to do. Most of us don't want to stay connected to a vine that calls us to live as its branches, stemming out from it. And so we try to fudge things a bit and we, we say that we're spiritual but not religious. And we think that we can hang on to the something more that is God when we say that, while disconnecting from any of the responsibilities that come along with believing in him. And while it sounds good to say I'm spiritual but not religious, it's actually not what faith is about, because there is no commitment there. No commitment to anything or to anyone beyond ourselves. Imagine planting some seeds and then repeatedly going back to them to dig them up to see how they're doing. Those seeds are not going to stand much of a chance, are they? And yet that is exactly the temptation we give into when it comes to our faith journey. We want to be better people. We want the world to be a better place. We want to see God doing more. And we feel that all of these things should happen sooner rather than later. So rather than give God time, the time he needs, we keep going back to that seed of faith and we dig it up and we inspect it. And then we wonder why nothing much is happening, why it's not growing. But again, we blame God. We blame the church. We blame the people who go to church. Never us. Never our impatience. Remain in me, says Jesus. Abide in me. I will nourish you. I am the vine. You are the branches. With vines, apparently it can be quite hard to tell which is the trunk and which is the branch, which when you think about it, is an absolutely amazing thought in the light of the words that Jesus speaks about his being the vine and us the branches. Because it's a thought that opens up the possibility of us not just being connected to Jesus, but becoming one with him. Not through anything we can do to deserve that, of course, but simply through letting his life flow through us and help us to blossom in every way possible. But in order for that to happen, in order for us to be one, rather than simply connected, we need to remain. We need to remain and not go shooting off in whatever direction takes our fancy. We need to let the spiritual, like the natural, run its course in its own time. So think 
oak tree rather than radish or spring onion. Think of the eternity that God promises us we have to grow in. Jesus, in his relationship with us, is in this for the long haul. The question is, are we? Do we have the courage to remain and to let Jesus' life flow through us? Amen. Lord Jesus, give us the patience to wait and the courage to see that quick fixes are just that, quick. When what you want is for us to enjoy life without limit, may we be open to relying more on you, on the life and love you offer, that we might flourish and blossom along with all your people in every time and every place. It is in love that we bring you, Lord God, our prayers for others. We think especially right now of the people of India. So many suffering through a new wave of the pandemic and so little healthcare support. We think of our partners in the churches of North and South India striving so hard to provide food for the hungry and help for the sick and facing the awfulness of sickness themselves, many losing their lives in the process. We think of the people of Malawi and of Palestine. We pray for a generous world in which the countries with surplus vaccines offer help to those with less than they need. And we pray for those who are struggling, not only against a pandemic, but against political regimes that seem not to care for the people under their care. We think of Myanmar, of Lebanon and Syria, and of all those who are so frightened and desperate that they are fleeing their homes. We pray for our own land, that as an election approaches, people may not go into their corners, but instead treat each other with respect and dignity, recognising that when political differences lead to the demonising of another, we all become less human. Help us to keep caring and to care for all. These things we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.
Go now to remain in Christ. Go to let him feed you all you need to bear fruit and to blossom. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and with all those whom you love, this day and always. Amen.